do you, what, what do you want done about this? Uh, oh, yeah, we've got a protection on it, just say. Um, I didn't know anything. Well, we'll say okay, because we can't renew it now, because you're doing all this. At some point, I'll need to... Oh. Right, so you, you could, Stuart, if you wish, you could yeah, mute everybody and I'll unmute myself. Yeah, we could do. I think there was only one person there who hadn't muted them. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, right. I'll, I'll um, say good evening to everybody. My name is Stuart Wall. I'm the regional organiser for East Midlands and Central Region. Um, and tonight we've got the return of Chris Upton, who even in my time has visited us three or four times. And I know he will have visited before and um, always gives us a really interesting talk. So I'm going to hand over straight to Chris. Um, Chris, questions? Do you, do you stop for questions or do you want Yeah, to... yeah, what we'll do, it's like a normal club talk, so there'll be two halves and we'll have a 10 minute comfort break in the middle and um, we can answer any questions then. And then of course at the end as well. So uh, that's probably the best way I think. So Fantastic. Yeah. So I'll just say good evening to everybody and hand over to Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much to it. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I hope you're all well. And uh, first of all, big thank you to Stuart for inviting me back again. I think this is my my third talk, I think, to uh, to the RPS uh, whilst uh, under Stuart's stewardship. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is my I think it's approaching now fast approaching my 150th talk in the last 15 months. So I've had a bit of practice at Zoom and uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll get a decent talk tonight. Um, Tonight, um, as a bit of an introduction, I've got a little video to play you, but for those of you that don't know me, and I know there's many that do, but um, uh, my name's Chris Upton. I'm a travel, landscape and social documentary photographer. I live in Southall or Southwell, whichever. I'm not, I'm not fussed. Uh, when, when one lives there, it's Southwell. Um, I'm an associate of the Royal Photographic Society, and as uh, Howard was just mentioning then, I go back to the days of Les Yallop, who started the RPS region, and I remember the Sunday events must be the early 90s, very late 80s, maybe early 90s, which were fabulous. And we got some really good speakers. And they were the days when perhaps the speakers that we got for the RPS talks were, you know, a different level to what we were getting at the time in clubs. So uh, some fantastic speakers. And they they really inspired me, I think, and helped me along the way. And uh, um, so hopefully tonight I can, uh, I can probably pay some of that back and uh, inspire you. And hopefully you'll enjoy some of the images at least this evening. Um, I'm also very proud to be uh, an official Fujifilm ambassador and um, I've been one for the last seven years, uh, which means that I, I shoot with Fuji equipment um, exclusively um, and I swapped from Canon about eight years ago actually. Um, and I find the system really, really good. Um, there'll be a little video in a minute, which has got a bit of um, product placement, let's say, and uh, we'll be talking about a product, but uh, don't worry, it's only about three minutes long. And uh, there's, a, there's another message behind that, which, uh, which I think uh, is the one that I prefer you to, uh, to take out of, that, uh, out of that talk. In addition to all of that, I do lots of club lectures a year. Um, in the last 18 months, of course, that's all been on Zoom. Um, and I also do my own workshops and uh, overseas tours. Well, at least I did until January 2020. But hopefully, fingers crossed, wind in the right direction, we'll be back up and running in Venice in November and, uh, and again in January. So um, more of that a little bit later on. Um, tonight's talk is called Finding the Beauty in Nature. So I think it's probably an appropriate time for me to share my screen and, uh, and we'll get started. Um, I just have to click on this, optimize for video, share sound, and we should be away. Good, good, good. Excellent. So um, this evening, finding the beauty in nature. Um, this actually started as a 40 minute talk, which I gave on behalf of uh, Fujifilm at the photography show at the NEC on the great outdoors stage. And I got a lot of good feedback from this. And uh, I decided, therefore, just to uh, increase it in size and make it one of my one of the roster of my, my uh, camera club talks. Um, and uh, and that's that's what you've got this evening, except the good news is that if you've already seen this talk in your club, then what I've done, especially for you guys this evening, is I've uh, I, I, I've uh, updated it and I've put some fresh content in. So it's the first airing of uh, of this one. Some of it might be familiar, but um, certainly not all of it. Um, it's a landscape talk and tonight there will be some uh, a varied selection of images. There will be some vibrant colour, some more muted colour, some from well-known locations and some less well-known. Um, but I hope overall that it's going to give you some inspiration. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions. 
So if there's anything that you, you know, you have a burning question, we'll maybe do that at half time and at the end. Um, but I'm very happy to answer anything that you might uh, you might want to know. Um, I'm going to start actually with uh, with a video because I thought it was quite good. And I did a video with Fuji to launch the X-T3. Um, but in that, I talk about my love for landscape photography and uh, why it inspires me. Um, alongside that, as I say, there will be a bit a bit of talk about the uh, the Fuji products, but um, uh, I think hopefully you'll enjoy the uh, the pictures and the video. So without further ado, let me uh, let me give you another little bit of introduction via the video. There's nothing quite like being out early in the morning, walking through the woods, smelling the bracken, feeling the cool breeze against your, your face, walking up to your location with nobody else around. In landscape photography, light is everything. Generally, when shooting bigger vistas, the best light is usually found at the beginning or the end of the day, when the sun is low and it's bringing out the texture, form and detail in the landscape. The Fujifilm X-T3 is truly a wonderful camera, reassuringly familiar to the X-T2, but with its new sensor delivering improved image quality and dynamic range, and so intuitive to use with all the buttons and dials on the top plate. It really does enable me to take even better pictures. I love shooting in the Peak District because there's so much variety from the harsh gritstone in the north to the softer limestone dales, there really is photographic opportunity everywhere. I love landscape photography because it's the thrill and anticipation of what might be. You never quite know what Mother Nature will throw at you, but when you overcome those challenges and capture the moment, it gives me a real sense of satisfaction. Fujifilm cameras are smaller, they're lighter, they're unobtrusive. For me, a good photograph captures a moment in time. It's a memory, a record of an unforgettable experience that I can enjoy for years to come. There you go. Gives you a little bit of an insight, I think. And uh, would you believe all of that was filmed, all, that, all those weathers were, were filmed on the same day? Uh, which was pretty amazing. We started the day and thinking we, we was never gonna, we were never actually gonna get anything done that day. But um, uh, typical British weather, um, important in landscape photography, and we we did get through it, which was good. So for me, landscape photography is all about uh, light, subject, composition, and that keyword emotion. Now. Light, we can't control, but we can hopefully plan for it. Although, as I say, with weather forecasts being notoriously wrong, it can be pretty difficult that. Um, getting our subject is critical. We must know exactly what, what, we want to, uh, what we want to shoot and why we want to shoot it. And it's only at that point then that we can concentrate on the composition, which I think is actually the biggest challenge that faces most photographers, certainly people that come out with me uh, on tuition days, one-to-one, -one, small groups, or, or my tours, the most commonly asked question is, how do you see a picture? And let's be honest, although my association is very firmly with Fujifilm, there are no bad cameras these days, are there? I mean, they're incredible, really, compared to what we had five or 10 years ago. Um, but the one thing that they can't do is decide what to include, or perhaps more importantly, what to exclude from that frame and how to compose those elements that are in front of us. And it was Dorothea Lang who said that a camera is a tool that helps us to see without a camera. And I think you can flip this and say that when we see without a camera, it helps us to see when we have a camera. So it's something that I have done all the time. You know, I'm forever, even when I've not got my camera, just thinking, oh, you know, that would make a good composition over there. I'd have to move up a bit, down a bit, left a bit, in, out, chop that bit off there, uh, crop it accordingly. And I'm doing that all the time as I'm walking around or sometimes driving around and, and it becomes second nature and it really helps you uh, with your composition. So if we've got the right light, if we know what we want to say, and we've honed our compositional skills, then hopefully that gives us that elusive nugget of um, an image that's got some emotion. Because the one thing for me with, with all photography is, and whatever 
genre of photography we shoot. Uh, I'm sure most of you will do some landscapes. You wouldn't be here otherwise, perhaps. But um, we're all looking for the same thing. We're looking, we're looking to create some sort of an emotional, positive emotional response from the viewer. And that's what we look to try and do. Um, so this image here was taken up at Saltwick Bay and I planned this, this is a summer sunset. And um, although it's on the East Coast, um, during the summer, during the June time, uh, the sun sets out to sea. So I, I went there specifically to take this shot and um, I quite like the sun setting and just get that little starburst in the pool there. And that little photographer out on the, uh, on, on the edge of the sea there, I think works quite nicely. Uh, and I, I wouldn't normally name drop, but the guy standing next to me, just out of frame here, was Joe Cornish. So there you go. You can, I guess you can't get better or more inspired than, uh, than having a chat with Joe, can you? So that was fabulous. Um, we move up to the Lake District, and uh, this was late afternoon. Uh, I think it was 1 uh, November at Friars Crag, and the sun's going down there behind Cat Bells. And what I quite liked here was just the shape of this little, um, almost like a little oxbow lake uh, in front of Friars Crag. You know, and one of the first uh, decisions that we have to make when we're composing our images in the landscape is what's going to be the proportion of land or sea and sky? And generally speaking, um, I'll work on the basis that if the sky is really interesting, and I think, you know, you'll agree here it, it is, then I'll give it two thirds of the, uh, of, of the frame and then leave a third on the base. So that's, that's sort of typically what I would, uh, what I would work with. Very soon uh, in the Peak District, uh, we're going to be faced with um, one of the most uh, incredible sights, I think, in certain parts of the Peak District that we see through the year. Um, and that is the start of the heather season. So what I thought I'd do is I'll just show you a few pictures um, from the region um, with heather in them. And um, we'll start off with this one, which is um, Fairbrook. And um, this one you can see is a, is a, is a long exposure. And um, this is a, an amazing place, actually, because one, this, this little waterfall here is not very big and it's the devil job to get down to it. You end up, if you don't watch it, it's very easy to fall in the, uh, in, in the stream there. It's quite tricky to get down to it. But when you get down there, um, it gives you a really nice view right up the, uh, up the valley there. And with that little clump of, um, of purple heather on the left-hand side, it adds an, a, a nice bit of color. Now, the, one of the uh, issues that we have when we shoot landscapes is just trying to balance the highlights in the frame. And usually the highlights are the sky. And typically in the past that what we would use is graduated neutral density filters. But of course, in this situation here, we can't use those because if we darken down the sky with a grad filter, we're going to darken down the land as well. So what I started to do when I took this picture is bracket and blend. And I've done that more and more. And nowadays, um, I don't use gradual neutral density filters. The only filters that I use are a polarizing filter and ND filters to slow down um, uh, movement in the frame. So that's, that's what I did on this particular occasion. Certainly one of the best and, and most dramatic views in the Peak District is from here. And this is Bamford Edge overlooking Lady Bower. And if you get the chance to get, it's a bit of a pull to get up here, but it's well worth it because the view is just incredible. And of course, you know, the place comes alive, doesn't it? When, when the heather's out and uh, if you can just get a nice uh, display of heather in the foreground um, and you can manage your, your focusing to make sure that you get uh, front to back sharpness uh, and you've got some golden light on it uh, just before that sun pops down. It's the recipe, I think, for, for, for quite a nice uh, image. Um, further along the ridge, over to the, uh, the right-hand side there is uh, Derwent Edge, and you can just see uh, um, the reservoir down there in, in the valley. And this is a little outcrop called the Salt Cellar, and this one was taken, I think this was last year actually, um, and um, this was one again that was blended. It, well, I didn't use um, any ND filter, ND grad with this particular one, um, but as I say, you know, the, the, it's the Peak District's a wonderful place um, anytime, but it really does come alive when, um, when the heather's out. And also if you can combine that with some atmospheric conditions, um, and although the gritstone edges in the north, uh, particularly around Surprise View and over Owl at all is a, is, um, you know, is a real magnet to go there and, and, and shoot the heather, but there's other places as well. So this place here is, um, is Stanton Moor. And um, I got there early one morning before sunrise. And um, in this place, we got the combination of the beautiful heather. There's a few nice cobwebs in there. And this little stand of uh, silver birch trees together with the mist. And the mist adds atmosphere. And I'm gonna come back to mist um, in a moment. 
But I have to say that perhaps my favorite Heather image from the Peak District was shot, I think it was three years ago. And I'd, I'd run um, a, a workshop during the day and um, everybody had gone. It was sort of nine o'clock at night, up as nine. And, and, and I decided that what I would do is just try and stay in the car, sleep in the car and get up early in the morning for sunrise. And, um, you know, true to form, you can't sleep in a car, can you? It's just just terrible. Um, and so I sort of catnapped and I made myself a drink and played around on the phone and, you know, whatever. And eventually, um, you know, I went out and did, did a bit of astrophotography, which was interesting. Came back to the car at about one o'clock in the morning and managed to sort of catnap through till about four o'clock. Got out the car, walked back up, back onto over our Latour and got onto the top there, looking over towards Higator. And about 45 minutes before sunrise, this was the scene that greeted me. And it was just incredible. And, you know, sometimes I, I feel that it's the being there that's important. It's the experiencing. And nobody else was there. I was on my own. The, the, the sky had taken on the colour of, uh, of the purple landscape beneath it. Um, this little rock outcrop here was a perfect foreground. And I love the way that this little stone here points us into the picture. So we've got some foreground. The path meandering over the moor towards Higator, the flat peak in the background, takes us through the middle ground. And then in the background, we've got Higator, and then three or four miles there in the, in the background of Stanage Edge. And it was just incredible just to be there. And I think for me, often in situations like this, the ability to be able to capture a picture um, is the icing on the cake. Um, and it is the experience, which is perhaps the most important thing, because even looking at the picture, you know, it, it brings back those memories, but it's not still not quite the same as, as being there. And it does make up for, you know, not getting much sleep and making that effort and getting out there. Um, other times of year that, uh, that are, are good to shoot, um, as maybe when the poppies are out. And a couple of years ago, there was one location in the Peak District that um, became pretty popular for poppies. And um, uh, I went along and this was my, my, uh, my capture from this little place. And uh, this, uh, this farmer's field suddenly um, uh, was, uh, was adorned with all these poppies. And uh, apparently the farmer claimed that he never knew it was gonna happen. Um, unfortunately, I think um, it was inundated with people. Some of you may well have been there yourselves. Um, but I love this little shepherd's hut, this traditional shepherd's hut and uh, the poppies being backlit as the sun's just about to uh, set going down behind that tree. Um, so that was a, that was a fabulous evening as well. Um, let's have a look at a few water shots and I'm going to move away um, for a moment from the Peak District and let's go a bit further north to perhaps, um, you know, my favourite location in, in the UK, uh, the Lake District, um, because my love of landscape photography started when, um, when, when basically I just used to like walking and climbing. It started when I was in the Scouts and then, um, then I started going on my own, went with my mates. Um, and I spent, you know, four or five weekends through the autumn, through to the spring, every year going up for long weekends. And, um, and gradually what happened was that I, obviously I wanted to record those walks, but gradually and having joined Nottingham and Knotts Photographic Society and gone along to the RPS events, um, it made me realise that I, I didn't just want to record these. I wanted to start taking more landscape pictures. So, you know, it took me, um, you know, <laughs> I found that I wasn't bagging the 3000 foot peaks so much. and I was quite happy to spend half a day wandering down Borrowdale or on the edge of Derwent Water, as this picture is here. This one, uh, this shot here was taken um, very early in the morning. It's a four second exposure. Um, the clouds um, are being backlit by the sun that's about to come up. Um, and it's a it's a very popular location, but, you know, with good reason, I think it, it really is. And this place, um, you know, brings back so many happy memories for me. It's um, it's a wonderful place. Uh, and, and when I work with Fuji that you get the chance to uh, test gear for them before it's launched. And they asked me um, a few years ago to go and test the uh, the X 100 F, the fixed focal length. 23 mil which is a 35 mil full frame equivalent camera it's a tiny camera it's beautiful looks like a little range finder this shot was taken uh, while i was testing that as was this was this one as well and this one is taken from um the end of uh, friars crag looking down to the jaws of borrowdale um that same november november morning um a hint of mist on the lake there that little black dot in the distance there is a little char fisherman out there early in the morning and it was so still um, and so peaceful. 
And um, I guess the only other thing I would say is that, you know, what I've done here is obviously I've used this uh, this leading line from the from the fence. And I think all the weed and and, and debris on it, I think, adds to it, adds to the uh, interest uh, somewhat. But I quite like the way that the two islands seem to also act as a frame for the jaws of Borrowdale at the end. Um, and um, I do like shooting square. You'll see a few square pictures as we go through. And uh, what I tend to do is select the square crop in the viewfinder, which helps me compose it accurately. To do that on a Fuji camera, and I think nearly every other camera, you have to select RAW and JPEG, and then just select one-to-one, -one and you'll get a square crop in, in your viewfinder. Um, this is another favourite location, and this is down uh, towards the Langdales. This is Elterwater early in the morning, and this one, um, this one's not uh, November. This is uh, May time, six thirty-six in the morning. I think the EXIF data told me. <coughs> Excuse me, but the um, the mist, as you can see, really does add some atmosphere. And if you're looking for that extra thing, then you know mist really works well. And um, you know, if we've got mist, we've got no wind. And if we've got no wind, it means that we can get still water and we can get some fabulous reflections. Um, and it is a bit of a mecca, this place. I think the last time I was here, when there was mist there, there were about 18 photographers here. I think Instagram has got a lot to answer for. Um, and um, a lot of these honeypot locations now are, um, are becoming overrun, I think, which is, which is a bit of a shame, but it does mean that we then have to look for you know, our own compositions and, um, and different compositions. Um, let's go a bit further afield, but still with the theme of mist. And let's go to Lake Bled in Slovenia. Now on this location here, I did something that I don't normally do. Um, normally what I'll do is I'll spend a little bit of time in one place and then move on, trying to get as many places covered as I could. But on this uh, particular situation, I stayed in Bled for three consecutive nights. And, um, and came down to this very same location for the three consecutive mornings. You know, and that's really interesting. Um, that was a different experience for me. And I think there's a lot to be said for that because you get to know an area really well. But what was very interesting was how different those images were on those three consecutive mornings. I have to say this one was my, uh, my preferred um, conditions, my favorite image. And you know, there's just so much atmosphere. It almost feels to me like that lake's boiling and the mists swirling around. And we can see in the background, there's the mountains in the background and there's the uh, there's a crag on the left. You can just about make out the castle there on the left-hand side and, and the Church of the Assumption there in the, in the center of the lake. But it's got so much atmosphere, hasn't it? So the trick really is to look out for mist. And um, what I would say is, uh, it's really important to have some locations that you can go to locally when you get those conditions. You could almost, you know, wake up a bit early, look out your window, and if there's somewhere 15 minutes away, just dive down there. And that's exactly what I did uh, on this morning uh, in September. And those of you that live um, in Nottinghamshire will perhaps recognise that that is shot from Gunthorpe Bridge. Um, and this is uh, an early autumn mist, uh, misty morning in September. Um, and what you're really looking for to get these conditions is when we've had warm, wet days and then we'll get a, a cold, clear evening. Um, and there's an app which can really help you find uh, the conditions because not only does it give you cloud cover, but uh, it gives you a uh, dew point as well. And that's an app called Clear, uh, excuse me, Clear Outside, which is really, really good. Of course, when you've got mist, you've just got to watch the exposure because your camera will tend to underexpose because of the brightness. So to get that um, that brightness back into the into the mist, you just got to open up your exposure, probably between three, um, three quarters of a stop and a stop and a third, something like that. The next shot was taken a little bit further along the riverbank, actually, um, not at the same time, different time, but it's still a very good location. And this was the sun coming up in the winter. And during the winter, the sun comes up behind these trees. <coughs> and I was there taking this shot and it was a landscape shot. The camera's on a tripod, shutter speed didn't matter. And all of a sudden I realized there were two swans coming upstream. And it's amazing how quickly swans swim. Um, especially when they're coming across the frame. And so the benefit of the, the Fuji system is that, as I mentioned in that video, everything is available on the top plate. So it makes it very, very quick indeed to move from a situation where shutter speed isn't important 
to suddenly where it's a, a very important factor because the last thing you want is is blurred swans and you want to capture these swans as they enter the frame not as they're halfway through or as they're leaving it so you know just in almost a split second i was able to change the settings um, and capture those swans in the appropriate position um, now i've had some excellent days out in the peak district i've had some pretty disappointing ones as well that's all part of the the bargain of or the bag of being a landscape photographer um, but i have to say one of my uh, one of my best mornings was one when i uh, went out to chrome hill um, the forecast, according to Clear Outside, was going to be for a great sun, sunrise. There was high cloud and, um, and it was going to be backlit. And I thought this would be fabulous. It would be a great, great sunrise today. So as I drove out from, uh, from home, I got to Matlock and it, all of a sudden I'm in mist and the mist became thick fog. And as I arrived um, just below Chrome Hill, I, I'm just in thick fog. And um, for those of you that know the place, you sort of walk up what's called the Dragon's Back and all of a sudden, I appeared above the mist and uh, walked through this gate here under this uh, this beautiful old oak tree. And then uh, it's a pretty steep walk up this bit, but um, you can get high up here. And I'm not I'm not I'm not kidding. It was absolutely amazing. The mist was just swirling around. It was ebbing and flowing. So I'm standing on Chrome Hill and Park House Hill is opposite you there. Uh, probably the two true peaks in the uh, in the Peak District. And this was actually an underwater reef. Um, millions of years ago so it's amazing to think that all of this was under the sea at one stage um, but it was just so so atmospheric and I think you know I've talked a bit about mist and you can see we have had some very sort of atmospheric conditions but this one actually uh, was amazing and the other thing was that I thought it would probably sort of dissipate after a you know a couple of hours but it didn't it lasted until almost lunchtime so I was like a kid in the sweet shop running around taking lots and lots of different compositions um, but I was fortunate to find another location um, during lockdown, which was fairly close to home. And this is one here and, you know, appropriate time of year and a bit of mist. And it just adds to that atmosphere, doesn't it? Using a long lens, which I love using in the in the uh, in the landscape, because I think I could quite exist using a long lens or and a wide angle lens. And um, I could probably give up the middle bit um, because the long lens for me does two things. It compresses perspective, uh, which it's done here. And it also isolates detail. And when you isolate detail, it just means that it really helps your composition because you're leaving the viewer in no doubt of where you want them to look. But here, compressing that perspective, I think worked really well. <coughs> just around the corner from there, I got this shot here. Now, one of the things that we look for um, um, as, um, well, any photographer really in our compositions is separation. And unfortunately, uh, with so many deer there, I wasn't gonna, ever going to get separation, but I think you'll forgive me for that. It was the conditions were just too good. And just having that stag there, just uh, in that appropriate position, I think really worked uh, very, very nicely. So, you know, weather conditions, um, you know, when do we go out? I think the bottom line is, um, you know, disregard the weather forecast and go out whenever, because whatever the weather conditions, there are always opportunities to take pictures. I remember I was doing a shoot for uh, Fuji up in the Lake District and we were on the side of Thirlmere and it was blowing a gale and I was trying to protect the camera. I got a big golf brolly above the camera and uh, the, the, the rain was just sheeting down Thirlmere. Uh, it really was. And it was, um, I, you know, I was struggling to hold this brolly, keeping the camera. It wasn't keeping me dry. It was keeping the camera dry. Um, and then I happened to look around and it's always good to look behind you. And uh, when I look behind me, um, the soft light and the rain had, had created this beautiful sort of uh, impression, this feeling of soft light and diffusion. Um, just, uh, you can see it sheeting in there in the background. And um, I just love the colors here, these autumnal colors uh, in the pine trees and then the uh, deciduous trees just changing color. And again, you can see it's a, it's a square crop too. So um, uh, it, works, it works quite nicely. Um, but of course, you know, the most inclement weather that we can get is, uh, is usually the winter, isn't it? And, um, you know, I think the winter's great because it just gives us a different perspective. Often we don't get, you know, fabulous winters photographically that we can get out there and, and, and typically sod's law for the last couple of really good conditions that we've had. I've not been able to get out last year because of lockdown, couldn't travel. Um, but you might remember, was it three or four years ago when we got the beast from the east? Well, I'd been booked on a lecture tour doing uh, three or four clubs in Suffolk and Essex, and uh, I was staying down there when the Beast of the East came in. 
and uh, I had the pleasure for two consecutive mornings of digging my car out of about a foot of snow. Um, and then eventually I went off and I did some some uh, landscape photography during that uh, those those days. I've got a couple here for you. This is um, this is one that was taken uh, by the River Stour. So this is Constable Country, not far from Dedham Mill and um, incredible conditions for a very short uh, period of time, because it was one of those days when, you know, this was the respite. This was the lull before literally the storm. And uh, you can just see over in the right hand side there, the storm is starting to come in. And about 10 minutes after I took this, I got absolutely drenched. But using a wide angle lens, it's made this, this foreground look much bigger. So this little patch of, um, of ice on the water that's snow covered worked really quite nicely. And using um, a wide angle lens, this is the Fuji 10 to 24. So full frame terms, it's 16 to 35 um, wide open. It emphasizes foregrounds. And if you're using a wide angle lens, you've got to make the most of foregrounds. And so that's what I used here. I think it was the next day um, I wanted to go down to um, uh, Dover Court to take a picture. I wanted ideally to do a shot of the little bug lighthouse and I wanted to do a long exposure. Um, a long exposure means, you know, two minute exposure. But when I got there, um, the conditions were so, so tough and treacherous. There was no way. It was windy, it was blowing a gale. There was no way I could ever do a long exposure. And in fact, this shot here was taken with me um, sort of hiding and uh, shielding myself behind my car door. And it was sort of banging against me as I was trying to take this picture. And I quite like this, uh, this, this almost, you know, it's, it's, it's um, I'd say it's unique, but it's, uh, we don't see it too often, do we, with beach huts and snow. And um, I did the beach huts on their own. And then I quite like the ones with the, with the trees in as well. And the bareness of the trees almost added to the, uh, the cold and the feeling in that picture. And as I say, that's what we're trying to communicate in these, in these images. We'll go back up to the Lake District and um, this jetty here, uh, poking out onto Allswater, a fabulous morning. Uh, this is a 90 second exposure. And um, what I like here is the, is the contrast. And contrast is an interesting concept in composition because it's something that I look to use a lot. And that contrast can be color, it can be, uh, it can be scale, it can be large versus small, it can be texture, rough versus smooth. But here, for example, I like the contrast between the warm tones on the jetty and then the, the warm tones on the fell side, contrasting with that steely gray blue tone of the water, the sky, and of course the snow on the fell sides as well. Um, this shot here taken at sunset uh, from surprise view looking over Keswick towards uh, Skidor in the background and that dusting there of uh, almost like icing sugar on the top of Skidor was uh, was just beautiful and it was just a fabulous place to be and you know it's a, it's a great location um, surprise view uh, and uh, you know I always go up there when I'm in the lakes just to see what's happening and uh, particularly in autumn it's it's great but um, yeah lovely to get some uh, some winter snow there and I think this was wasn't last year, I think it was the year before I went up to the Winnets Pass to do some sunrise shots and walked round to the other end and then looked up the pass. And, um, you know, what I like about this is the three cars, you know, numbers in photography, three always works well. We work with the rule of thirds, don't we? So if anywhere, anytime you can get three objects in your image, it usually can work quite well. So I'm pleased that there were three cars there, but, um, but yeah, looking up the uh, dramatic Winnets Pass, I actually went out here um, this week, I think it was Monday morning, I went out and uh, left home at 2.30 in the morning and uh, it was absolutely just thick mist. I couldn't see a thing here. So I waited and waited and, and, and uh, it was a bit of a, well, it wasn't a washout because I went somewhere else and you'll see a couple of pictures from there uh, very shortly. Uh, but I like the winter um, and I like what it does. And I talked about using a long lens and isolating detail. <coughs> and I love this little hawthorn tree. You know, this reminds me that it's, it's such a delicate picture. And I think it's because of the pink morning light that's just coming up, the sun's coming up behind me over the moor. And seeing this little, uh, this little hawthorn tree, it reminds me of almost like a ballerina's tutu and the two little legs there, uh, just doing a pirouette. Um, I don't know, it's amazing what you see in your own pictures, isn't it? You might see something different. And I guess that's the, uh, that's the beauty of photography. But from that winter's morning where everything's quite delicate and quite, um, quite light in tone, 
Um, let's go to the opposite end of the scale. And this one was taken on uh, Higator. And this was a really cold, uh, frosty morning. It was January, pre-sunrise. And it, it's pretty high up here. And if it's a bit breezy, it's very, very cold. And the sun is starting to come up over Sheffield that you can see there over to the left. And again, what I liked here is the, the warm tones um, uh, coming up of the sunrise and it, how it's just catching those rocks on the right hand side. But then just those those few rocks there on the left hand side that haven't quite caught the sun yet and they're still frosted in in uh, or got a dusting of frost on them. And, and they've got that opposite tone, haven't they? They've got that blue, that cool blue tone. So, you know, it's that it's that contrast that we've got there. Same location, just a bit further down there as we walk on towards the end of, uh, of, of Higator, but a different day, um, is this shot here. And this is looking up the um, uh, Burbage Valley. And, uh, you know, I like this one because I like this arrangement of rocks. Um, and when I do my composition talk, I use this one because I use this as an example of, you know, what's important when you do landscape photography is that generally speaking, particularly if you were using a, a wide angle lens, we need to be able to get front to back sharpness, don't we? We want everything sharp. Well, this one was taken on my 14 mil prime lens, which is the equivalent of a 21 mil full frame. And I know that with that lens um, at f11, focused on three feet, everything from one and a half feet to infinity is sharp. So it means that I don't have to focus. I can just plonk that camera down, compose, and I just make sure that I've got nothing closer than one and a half feet, and I know that everything's sharp. And that really, for me, is one of the secrets about, you know, uh, being successful in whatever genre of photography you shoot, because sometimes, you know, you can get conditions when that lighting is, is just fleeting. And it's no good scratching your head thinking, now, how do I get this uh, front to back sharpness? Or how do I change to uh, auto exposure bracketing? These are the things that you need to know. And you need to know almost so that you can operate that camera blindfolded to be successful, I, I think, in the landscape, to make the most of those instants almost of, uh, of light. Now, you've seen some pictures there of, um, of, of sunrise and sunset images, which is, you know, usually I said in the video, it's a, it's a very good time to shoot. But actually what I find is that um, I really like shooting with side lighting because uh, we'll stay on Higator, but just um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this shot here. This is called the Dino Dinosaur's Footprint, I think it is. Um, and um, we've got some beautiful side lighting here coming in from the left. And the benefit of this light is that it brings out all the relief and the texture in the landscape. And usually, you know, this is just a golden hour. So this will be after the sun has risen, um, before the sun gets too high. We've got that lovely warm light bringing out, as I say, the texture and the detail in the landscape. And we've still got some really nice uh, colour in the, in the sky as well. So there's one shot and here's another one looking the other way. Similar concept here. This one's taken on uh, on Kerber Edge um, early one morning. And it really is, you know, great to be able to get out there. And I found that actually last year um, and a couple of times I've been out sort of from the past month or so that when even when you go out early now for sunrise, there are people out there who are just watching. They're not even photographers, uh, photographers, sorry, that they're, they're just out there watching sunrise. And I think that you know, everyone's had to stay local, haven't they? And I think um, these places are going to get very, very busy for quite a bit longer. But um, at least if you go out early, there are fewer people than there are at sunset. Um, this one's taken on Stanage Edge, uh, an autumnal shot late afternoon. And what I like here is just the sweep of the rocks as they sort of lead in there from the left hand side and they sweep round. And you can see how Stanage Edge meanders away this three miles away as it does into the distance. And we've got the beautiful uh, valley there in front of us and we've got the you know the the, the bracken turning uh, it really is um, a fabulous place to shoot and this location here is one of my favorites this little knuckle stone here that's just almost on the horizon but compositionally it's critical that that stone there doesn't cut through uh, Stanley edge. it sits below the edge what i've tried to do here is use these foreground stones that almost um, act like a, a, a y uh, letter Y leading us in, uh, a fork leading us in there to the stone. And we've got that side lighting on, on, on the coming in from the left hand side, which I think uh, really works uh, quite nicely. Um, taken almost, I think, about the same time as I did the, uh, the, the Fuji video is this shot here. 
taken from you know perhaps the the biggest honeypot location in the peak district uh, before it got super super popular and any time now that you've got mist forecast in the hope valley uh, you're going to find that you're going to be in company with at least 15 to 20 photographers here uh, which is fine if everybody wants to stand this side of the gate but of course the minute someone wants to move the other side then it uh, it can get quite interesting let's say um, but what happens, of course, with the mist is that the mist usually it's a good place to go for mist because um, the Hope Valley is, is very prone to it. And uh, it, it does sort of ebb and flow over the landscape. And you'll see that in a moment. I'm going to show you two more pictures from this location uh, just before we have a, a, a break. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a great location. And looking to the, uh, the hills in the background, you can just see there we've got three hills um uh from loose hill over to wind hill and back to all there with um what you'll see in a minute is a little tree on them and um so this is a, a widish angle shot here but if you put um a longer and a quite a long telephoto lens on what i quite liked about that was these three hills in the background that were just sort of trying to emerge from the cloud and the mist and so I put the long lens on. Actually, I was doing a one-to-one -one tuition and I borrowed this one from, uh, from um, uh, the guy that was with me, Mick. It was very kind of him. So this is the 100 to 400 mil Fuji, which is a fabulous lens. So it's 150 to 600 mil. Uh, it's a great lens. And I took this shot here. This is really zooming in. And I decided that what I was going to do was try and create a, a gritty, a different sort of image, almost like the feeling that we would have got with sort of Tri-X, um, and a lot, yeah, as I mentioned before, three always works well in an image. Um, but what helps things to um, really stand out in composition is whenever we can get dark against light or light, or light against dark. And in this scenario, that little tree there on, uh, on back tour really works very, very well. The little uh, copse of trees um, also. But then I like the, uh, the fence on this foreground uh, hill as well. And that shaft of light where the sheep are just uh, grazing away there in the middle. And that uh, hill in the background there just sort of disappearing into the mist. So uh, really, really fabulous. But the fun didn't end there because um, what happened was that the mist then started to come in uh, across the valley. Uh, and basically what we did was we just stood there taking pictures of it like shooting fish in a barrel of the, of the mist coming in over the Hope Valley as the sun started to come up. Um, and, and backlight it with this lovely warm lighting. You know, in one minute, um, it seemed like the mist had gone and that was gonna be it. And then what seemed like only a few minutes later, we could hardly see anything again. And so it was just fabulous. It really was just like the sea ebbing and flowing over the landscape. Um, and again, it was just magical to be there, to experience it um, and to witness it. So that brings us to the end of the, of the first half. Um, if, uh, if I may, I'm, I'll give you a word from our sponsor uh, this evening, which is, which is me. Um, and just to say that um, if you've liked what you've seen and you'd like to keep in touch uh, and you'd like to perhaps know a little bit more about my tours, workshops, tuition, etc., if you uh, visit me at chrisuptonphotography.com, my website, a little box pops up. You can pop your details in. Um, and that means then that that will enroll you onto my newsletter um, distribution base. And um, I send a newsletter out not very often, five, six times a year. That's all. You're not going to be inundated with them, but it will just update you before everybody else gets told about what's happening. Um, and usually I'll put a few other things in there that you might find useful as well. Um, I only share your information with MailChimp. It doesn't get shared anywhere else. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. And if anybody would like any online help, then um, then I'm your man. I can certainly help with things like portfolio reviews, which might be for an hour or longer. Um, a more structured online mentoring program, which can be anything that you want it to be. It can be tailored to individuals' needs. And then I also do Lightroom training as well um, online, which has proved very popular. And of course, any Fuji users there, um, a couple of hours can really help you uh, get to know your Fuji camera inside out and maybe some of the things that you never found from not reading the manual. So there we go. It's um, almost a quarter to. Um, can I suggest that we get back together just before five to 10 minutes? Is that okay, Stuart? Yeah, that, that's great. Um, that's great, Chris. Did, did you want to stop sharing? Um, yes, I'll stop break? sharing, then so, everyone can. Uh, yeah, yeah well, sorry. That's, that's brilliant. Um, if, <coughs> I can just, if I can just ask a quick question. Yeah, um, sure. Chris, what's a manual? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's nice to play, isn't it? But but the thing nowadays is that 
you know, cameras, they, uh, they're having so many new features in them. And um, I have to say, I don't know whether it's the same with other cameras, but Fuji are really, really good at, um, at um, providing firmware updates that can often, you know, really make a massive difference to your camera. I always remember having an X-T2 uh, and they put a completely new autofocus system in it, uh, which had come out of the X-T3. Uh, free of charge and uh, you know so when when manufacturers I know I think Olympus might do it as well so I think that's fabulous and um, but there are inevitably things that you've missed and you don't know about and you don't know what you don't know so yeah any Fuji shooters if you want to know a bit more then uh, then then give us a call sounds good so yeah so um if we stop did you say you have five two does that give you yeah let's do five, let's do five two and people can have a, a quick leg stretch and um Fantastic. and then I'll do any questions and we'll um we'll go again Brilliant. And if anybody wants to chat during the uh, break, um, you're, you're more than welcome to. You, you, you mentioned Joe Cornish, actually, and if I just do a little promotional uh, piece for the Indian chapter, um, Joe is talking to the Indian chapter of the Royal Photographic Society on, I believe, the 7th of August, UK time, 12.30. So that's uh, just after midday. Um, and to find the details of that, you just need to go on to the RPS website and at the top it says about and then as you scroll down, you'll see chapters or international actually international, I think it is now and um, then just click on India and uh, they do a series of talks. So, uh, yeah. oh, thanks, thanks for uh, promoting that, uh, Stuart, because um, more than 100 have already registered so far. So it's, it's going to be a sellout, I think. So. Great. Joe's always a great draw, of course. Yeah, yeah. And um, well, I think that's a sort of interview type, type thing, isn't it, Avijit? Indeed, with, um, indeed. Joe, indeed. Yeah. Just like uh, Joe's interview with uh, Peter Hayes, which kicked off the Distinction Live talks, of course, last year. It did. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they were quite sort of uh, interesting talks, weren't they? Yes, yes. And I think he drew... Uh, 300 plus for that inaugural uh, interview actually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. the um the, the average i think on average we we had that sort of number um on those distinctions talks they were quite sort of rapid one hour talks weren't they it was oh. a stunning success Stuart. really yeah. stunning yeah. success for the society yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was I, I was in the background with all those avatars doing the slides. You kept it going. You and, kept it going. <laughs> and we were, we were working we were working to scripts. I felt that I was working for ITN at that time, and I was I was, <laughs> I was listening to every single word and looking at listening for keywords and then moving the slide forward. <laughs> yeah, not my normal well, you sort did of. You a great uh, job, Stuart. Really, because, they, well, because all of that was so slick and had a light touch but none of that happens without preparation and organization none of it does so well done really. thank you there was a lot of preparation and it was absolutely it was, and it was kind of so alien to my normal make it up as i go along type approach <laughs> <laughs> now i know that's not true <laughs> so, it was good fun it was good fun yeah. <laughs> i hope they come back actually you know they they would be they would be good wouldn't wouldn't it it's um it really did um I mean I think we can we can afford to take a little bit of a break at the moment because yeah. we've we've got a situation where we're almost kind of struggling to keep up with the demand for assessments. Yes, right. So um, it really sort of um, developed that side of it. Yes. Um, but then of course people get onto a journey, don't they? And they they they're moving forward, and then they want to get their work assessed. Indeed, um, indeed, and yes. And I guess it's sort of pent up demand, Stuart, you know, for uh, 16 months of lockdown, it's meant lots of people have been doing projects and yeah. working them up. And so now that it's released, you know, it's, it's coming through, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. I mean, last week, I think on the licentiate, we did 43 over the two days. Wow. That's, um, and then in addition to the two days of course there's the actual going through them as well of course before I mean, that. I mean Richard Hall is on the meeting tonight and he's, he's a licentiate assessor and you're getting used to that now aren't you Richard it's it. <laughs> yeah. so it's uh yeah it's quite a quite a sort of uh, task really good no 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 really really good really good yeah yeah what, what's your view Richard because I know um your feedback when you're writing that what from it from the from doing the online panels yep yep 
Well, I think it works really well, but it is it, it is a lot of work. We sort of do 38 panels or 40 panels or, or yes. so over the two days. That was the previous one, wasn't it? Yeah. That's and, a and lot. That's you have, a you have lot. to look at them carefully because you can't assess from Zoom because you just haven't got the detail. No. So you're looking at 15 minutes a panel to write your notes. So it's probably two full days preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. To do them justice. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the write up, which is probably another three or four hours after, after the assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's fascinating that the, the breadth of work yes that you see um and and some some of the international panels can be really interesting mm. yes yes um, well but of course in some countries they read right to left don't they so when we're talking about designing a presentation they're not seeing yeah, things flowing point. Yes. left to right they're, they're they're seeing right to left and of course you know we, we as assessors need to appreciate that sort of thing so and it's... and do you have you seen that distinction? For example, you know people from Arabic countries, you know where uh, where they do just that, they read from right to left, and therefore the the uh, organisation of the images reads yep. better right to left too, right? Yeah. I, I I I'm not sh well. I, I've not much experience, but I don't think I've seen any. No, they're, 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 they're few and far between, but I can remember one about two or three, two years ago, where we were yeah. really trying to work out why it was a one row presentation. So it was a digital presentation at the time. Of course, you can do digital print in one, two or three rows now, but it yes. was when digital was just one row and it just didn't seem to flow until we looked at it right to left. Right. And then because of the content, we kind of put two and two together and said, well, yes. actually, this does work. Right. To yes. And yes. So gave the um, cause of course, we don't know who the applicant is or where they're from when no. they're assessing. So we, we kind of gave them the benefit of the doubt. And, and sure enough, it was from somebody from a country that fascinating, does, yeah. Stuart, really, yeah. really fascinating. So Can you recall who the uh, success of Canada that was? Um, it, well, I'd have to think about it. I was, yeah. it, was in, it was in Bristol and it was about two years ago. Right, 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 so, right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's a great, uh, uh, you know, case in point, an example of how, uh, you know, we are an international society and we need to uh, accommodate those different aesthetics, those different viewpoints, everything. Yeah. I think so. It's all part of the learning curve, isn't it? And it's all part of the experience, really. Yeah. So, yeah, that is fabulous, fabulous stuff. So uh, yeah, well that was that was an amazing first half, Chris. Really, uh, I used to play golf at Stoke by Naylan. So when I was looking at your um, <laughs> sort of um, images <laughs> from that area, it was taking me right back. Um, Very good. Although we we used to call Stoke by Naylan heart 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 attack hill because the hills were yeah, absolutely yeah. horrendous. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, mm. yeah. So did club members keel over then, um, Stuart? Say that again, sorry. Did, did club members keel over on well, the nineteenth hole? Well, well, we always used to do that, but this <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a tough course. They, um, they, they, um, I don't know whether they still do, but the seniors hold yeah. one of the uh, tournaments there. Right, it's just outside Colchester, so um, towards right. Sudbury. Oh right, um, yeah. yeah. And there's there's two courses. One was a little bit flatter than the other one, but the the main one, my goodness, the hills, and where wow. they came, where they came in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's relatively flat county, really, in most parts, isn't it? Suffolk it is, yeah. There, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, uh, well, nearby Norfolk and Suffolk are much flatter, of course. Yeah, aren't they? yeah. 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 and no, Cambridge too. Yeah, 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 very much so. So lovely. So um, looking around the room, I think most people whose cameras are switched on are around. So unless anybody's, did, did you say you wanted to do some questions before you start again? I'm happy if anyone's got any specific questions relating to the first half or if you want to leave it until the end, that whatever. I'm happy to answer some now if you want or we'll do it at the end. 
Are you waiting with bated breath, Ralph, or um, no? No. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> put my headphones on. Oh, uh, <laughs> did, mic on it. <laughs> you, you look the part now, Ralph. Yeah. yeah, you got the yeah. I didn't. I didn't see you with those on in the first half, Ralph. Were you listening or just looking at the nice pictures? I've got the, I've got the sound on my audio. Oh, right. So I'm only right. using the mic effectively. Got you. Full control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All traffic control. Yeah, coming to land. Coming to land. So did anybody else have any questions before we make a start on the second half that you'd like to ask now? Or? There's one in the chat, Stuart. Yeah, hi. Do you have the XF1024 and what do you think, says Simon? Um, well, the honest answer to that one is I did have it um, and, and and sold it. So um, the jury's out whether I, whether I replace it or not, but I have got the 14 mil, which is a, a cracking lens. So the 10 to 24, for anyone who's not a Fuji shooter, is like a 15 to 35, so Canon or Nikon, 16 to 35. Um, yeah, and it's a very, very good lens. It was one of my most used lenses. Um, Fuji updated it uh, with um, well, a few, they made it weather sealed and put an aperture ring, a marked aperture ring on it. So a bit cosmetic, the optical performance didn't improve um or, or change or get worse um so i haven't i haven't updated it so the answer to that one is i did have i don't it's a very good lens um but so is the 14 mil which is a prime lens and probably in terms of image quality you know you'd get better image quality from the 14 mil because it's a fixed lens but then it, it then it's fixed so it depends really what you want but it's a very good lens lovely thank you and um Pamela asks, what's the app you mentioned, which was probably the Sunrise one, was it? Is that yeah, um, the weather app it is. Um, oh, well, there's there's two apps that I'll mention because I don't think in this talk I, I go into any more detail on it. So I think one of the best weather apps is one called Clear Outside, C-L-E-A-R, Clear Outside. Um, and then the best overall, well, the two really useful photographers uh, apps are the Photographer's Ephemeris, um which is free for a desktop but you pay for it for um for your ipad or, or your phone um i can't remember how much it is but it's not bad but it's really really good because that will help you plan any sunrise and sunset shoots and uh, it will give you lots of information um as does another app which is uh, brilliant which is photo pills p-h-o-t-o-p-i-l-l-s photo pills now the benefit of that app is that it not only has all the sunrise sunset information it has all the moon phases it has all your astro information you know where the galactic core is going to be uh how visible it's going to be uh it will give you um golden hour timings blue hour timings at any part of the world whenever as well as all that it will give you long exposure tables so you put in your exposure without a 10 stop filter and it will tell you what the exposure is with that filter or a six stop or a three stop or whatever and then it will also do um, a lot of depth. Of, there's lots of depth of field information in there as well. Tables and charts, uh, including hyperfocal distances as well. So when I talk with about the 14 mil lens and focusing at F11 at three feet, everything from one and a half feet out is sharp. That's where you can pick up that information. And all you do is you plug in your camera at the top, select your camera, select the, the focal length, and it will give you that information. So it's really, really useful. Uh, you do pay for that. I think it's like nine pounds or something, but it's really worth it. Photo pills. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. One, Good. One, shall we, shall yeah. we crack on and um, yep. I'll answer any more questions at the end? Yep. Okay. Handing over to you then, Chris. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you. Let's back here and here. Okay. That's where we left off. Right. Um, thank you for those questions. And, uh, um let's move on let's um let's start off let's just do two or three uh seascape pictures and i guess living in the center of the country it's not really that great is it for, for seascapes uh living in nottinghamshire or leicestershire i guess um but uh, but nonetheless um, i do venture out occasionally to uh to the seaside and uh, this first shot here was taken down in cornwall um it was taken in may sunset shot in watergate bay uh which is which is just fabulous um and one of the first things that I noticed when I got there was that the clouds were actually coming towards me. And if ever you do um, a long exposure, if you want this sort of whooshing effect, 
that's that's what you want with the clouds and i think that for me it adds so much more dynamism to the picture rather than just having them sort of blurred across the frame so if you've got them coming towards you then uh, certainly on long exposure you're going to get some pretty dramatic uh, effects and that's uh, that's what i did here and the thing was with this that you look at this because it's um it's 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 a long exposure there's a thin film of water on the beach We've obviously got the, the waves sort of coming in and out as well. So they're not sharp. So the only bit that's sharp really is the absolute horizon and that little bit of land, that spit of land over on the left-hand side. And apart from that, everything else is, uh, is, is moving uh, to a greater or lesser degree. So I do like using uh, long exposures. Um, from there, we're gonna flip over to um, a trip that I made um, well, it was a few years ago now, actually, but it was a fabulous trip and went over to uh, the Washington state in the US. So the far west of, uh, of the US um, flew into Seattle. And um, th there there's, there's, there's just loads to photograph because you've got the coast and you've got all the rainforests. And boy, you know, now I know why you've got rainforests uh, in that part of the world. But we went over there, there were three of us that went over and uh, we went for a week and we were going to spend most of the time on the coast. But the weather was actually pretty poor and we had to come inland. Uh, but there were a couple of nights when we got some good conditions. So um, here's a couple of shots from uh, from those nights. This is the uh, the first one. And it's so dramatic here because you've got these little bluffs sitting out uh, out in, in, in the well, when the uh, sea comes in, out in the sea with these uh, with these pine trees on and the sun there is going down um just poking its uh, its last rays through that gap in the rocks and i got my feet wet for this one because you can see that you know the benefit of having the, the tide coming in here <coughs> excuse me is that we've got a nice reflector the beach is a wonderful reflector and again we're back to that word contrast which i already quite like so this is sort of blue hour we've got that blue feeling but that's contrasting with that with that sun just just about to pop down there um behind those rocks same location um and another night i think it might have been the next night um this shot here and this is a bit earlier in the evening this is golden hour and i just love the way that the light is just kissing the side of that uh, that rock there um, and of course, when you're there, you're looking for you're looking for a foreground. You're looking with a wide angle lens. If you want the big vista, then we're looking for a foreground. And um, actually, it's, it's an interesting one, this, because this little rock pool here, I say little rock pool, because it, it was it was a little rock pool. It's just that when you use a wide angle lens close up, it makes it look so much bigger. And um, and so that's what I've done. One of the things that you've got to be careful of when you're working on a beach is that and you're looking for your compositions that you're very, very careful that you don't walk too far into a composition and then decide actually it was better where you were before. And then you're gonna be spending uh, quite a bit of time cloning out your footsteps. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's important to get separation in composition between key elements um, and no more so than here. So you'll see that the two rock pools there, there is space on either side of those uh, before we get to the edge of the frame. So they're not being cut or not cutting them off. Um, so that was a conscious decision um, at the time. Now the weather when we were there, as I say, it wasn't great. And so we went inland and we went into the Columbia River Gorge, which was incredible. Um, but what we did do was we drove from the western side of Washington State and the coast right over to the eastern side, which borders with Idaho, to a place called the Palouse. And some of you may well know about this and some of you may well have been, but it's a fabulous place. And uh, the best way I can describe it is a bit like Tuscany lots of gently rolling farmland and they grow wheat and canola, which is uh, rapeseed. Um, and there's lots of undulations in the landscape. And uh, when the sun goes down or rises, it just kisses that uh, those undulations. And we've got these wonderful um, highlights and shadows cast across the landscape. And what I've done here uh, compositionally is, is purposely excluded the sky because there's no point in putting the sky in. The sky was actually quite pretty bright um, and I didn't want that. This was just about the land and the undulations and, and the light kissing the land. And, you know, this is not Fuji Greens, by the way. Um, this was uh, taken in June. And um, I remember this year looking at our crops in June and they're so vibrant, aren't they, at that time of year as they're beginning to grow. And that's the case here. But certainly when we get that, um, that, sculpture, that sculpture sort of lighting 
it really brings out the best in the place. And uh, this is taken from a little uh, butte, a little hill called Steptoe Butte, and you can drive to the top of it. It was you to look over the landscape with a long focal length lens. And, you know, I got this little focal point here of this interesting tree. And if you've got a, a nice leading line, an interesting wriggly creek like that, then it certainly helps you um, make the picture. We'll stay in the US, but we're going to go to the East Coast and we're going to go right up to Acadia National Park, which is about five hours north of Boston. And I spent a fabulous few days here um, a few years ago. And um, this is taken at Jordan Pond. Um, and I went, <coughs> excuse me, I went here to shoot sunrise and expected it to be, you know, a fabulous sunrise. I mean, it's not bad, but it wasn't exactly what I expected. Um, and one of the reasons I've put this in really is just to talk about white balance, just to say that um, <coughs> sometimes we we agonize over getting the white balance right. And, uh, you know, it must absolutely match what we saw when we were there. And some people go to the, the trouble of, of taking a picture of a grey card or a colour checker or whatever. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we can we can play around with that uh, white balance for creative artistic effect. And that's what, exactly what I've done here. And I just thought, I wonder what this will look like if I warm it up. And you can see from these rocks in the foreground that I have warmed it up. The clouds have gone warmer as well. And I quite like the effect. So, you know, I guess my message here is, you know, sometimes have a look at your images and just play around with that white balance. There is no right or wrong with white balance. Um, if you're looking to try and, you know, reflect absolutely what was there, then fine. But, you know, maybe sometimes you can get interesting shots by warming things up a bit or, or cooling it down. Um, OK, back to the Peak District here. This one is a bit of a seminal shot for me because um, I first bought uh, a Fuji XE1, which is a tiny rangefinder style uh, Fuji. And the idea was that that would run alongside my Canon equipment. And when I didn't want to go out with all the big heavy Canon gear, I could just take out the uh, 18 to 55 kit lens and this small camera, which is tiny. And, and that would be it. It would be fantastic. But I rapidly found that I loved using it. And um, so as soon as the X-T1 came out, I upgraded. And uh, we're now up to the X-T4, of course. And uh, this was um, a shot that was taken on my first outing with the X-T1. And here I've used a moderate telephoto lens to compress perspective. And again, we've got those atmospheric conditions. But as well as giving us some atmosphere, what's also helped compositionally is that the uh, mist has concealed elements that would otherwise have been distracting to the viewer. So in the background there, there's a farm and there's buildings, there's machinery, there's walls, uh, and you can't see any of that. All you can see is what I saw when I was there and what I want you to see, which is just this gentle recession of these trees going, I mean, there are no blacks in this picture and there are no whites. This is just you know shades of gray um, from the darker tones in the foreground to the background but I love it because it's got such a soft and, and, and gentle effect, this one. I'm just gonna to touch on something now, which um, you know is becoming, I think, increasingly important. And that is uh, post-processing. Because I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, when you look around on something like Instagram, you'll see some incredible images. And bear in mind, of course, that you know, people that are posting on Instagram are only posting the best of the best. Uh, and some of these people um, are very good photographers, but they're also absolutely incredible digital artists. Um, and uh, I'm certainly not that, but I'm, I'm trying to improve my processing skills and try certain things. And I think, you know, you do need to do that because I think there are certain things that can really enhance your images. One of the things that I've done a little bit of uh, more recently is um, creating an effect on some of my images. So I'm just gonna show you this image here. This one was taken an autumnal shot uh, in Padley Gorge. And this is the straight shot. Um, and what I have started doing is using an effect called the Orton effect. Um, I think it was a Canadian photographer called Michael Orton who basically I uh, developed this, this concept, this technique. And what it does, it, um, it, it gives a, a glow to the pictures. It, it, it brightens up the highlights and gives a glow to, um, to the image um, and, uh, and warms it up a little bit. And you can play tunes with this. You can tweak it yourself. Uh, if you're not sure how to, uh, how to do this, the best thing to do is just go online and you'll find loads of YouTubes on the Orton effect. It's O-R-T-O-N. This is the straight shot. 
I'm going to show you another shot now, which has got the Orton effect uh, on it. And I don't know whether it's going to be, you should see it, probably see it easier on your own screens than you will do if you're in a, in a club. But you can see there, that's with it on. And if you look at the, particularly the golden foliage, you'll see what happens. So that's with it on, that's with it off. And so with it off, it's a bit, it's a bit crisper. Um, whereas when it's on, those highlights sort of bleed into each other and it just softens down that image and it works really well um, on, on highlights. So I thought I'd just show you a few, a few images that, uh, where, I, where I've used this. Now there's a time of year uh, in landscapes when we're almost sort of betwixt and between. So, you know, and I'm talking really the March, middle of March to the end of March and perhaps the first week or so in April when we've not got the drama of, of winter um, and we've not got the, the vibrant green and, and new shoots of growth of, uh, of, of spring. And it is a bit of a tough time to shoot. Um, and I went out then and I went down to um, uh, Wyoming Brook um, and I shot that picture there, which, um, which again, I've applied the Orton effect. I haven't got a before and after uh, on these subsequent pictures, but, um, but you'll see what, what it can do. And it, and it softens the image and it might be something that you think, well, you could try yourself. Okay, move away from the waterfalls and let's go up to um, Sherwood Forest. And this one is one of my, my, my favorite autumnal pictures. And again, this has just got this applied. And if you, do, if you use this in Photoshop, you can put it on a layer and you can adjust the opacity. You can decide to brush it in where you want or brush it out where you don't. Um, and you can, as I say, adjust the opacity to give it just the effect that you, uh, that you want. But it does help and gives you um, like a painterly effect. To, to your images. So it's really worthwhile playing around with, uh, with this technique and it works, it works very well with things like autumnal scenes and where you've got water, etc. This one here, I've been back to a few times to try and get you know, a decent uh, sunset and those conditions, they, they only lasted for a matter of moments before the clouds covered up and it was just all that sort of dark blue um, over this pond here. And um, this is a very subtle effect here that, that I've used. So, you know, you, you, you might not be able to see that too well, but nonetheless, it has been applied and it will make a difference to, to your pictures. Um, and this next shot is, um, is paying a bit of homage to uh, Monet and his, uh, and his garden at Giverny. And um, Howard and Jackie will, uh, will recognize this one because um, I bumped into them when I was about to take this picture. And um, I'm not sure whether you, you got some uh, nice pictures that day, uh, Howard and Jackie, but uh, yeah, this was one of mine. And, and again, what I've done, I've softened this slightly with that Orton effect. And it's amazing, isn't it? We pay hundreds of pounds for crisp lenses and then we go and soften them afterwards. But um, at least this way you can have it both ways. You can have a pin sharp image and, and crisp um, resolution, or you can have something that's, uh, that's nice and soft as well. So that's, that, that can work really well. Um, and then the final one in this little set was taken in the Dordogne and um, just driving along and we came across this little barn here and uh, fabulous. And what caught my eye was the, the red pantiled roof contrasting against the green leaves. And uh, so this Orton effect here <coughs> was applied to the whole image, but then I painted it out, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> It's not COVID, I'm not positive, I can guarantee that, and it's not coming down the airwaves, but um, I painted it out of the, uh, of the road and then on the side of the barn and on the roof. So that, that, that's nice and crisp, but everything else is just a little bit softer. And I think it really, it's a nice effect um, that you can create by, um, by having a play with the Orton effect. Let's have a, 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 um, a look at a couple of images where mother nature has helped um, with lighting. You know, sometimes when we're in the studio, for example, we can decide how we're going to light a, a portrait and we can direct that light. Well, sometimes Mother Nature does it for us. And in this particular case, on this, uh, you know, very oh. famous location on, on Buttermere, um, you can see that the tree is, uh, is, is really well lit, but the, the water and the, and the fells in the background are darker. And that's no jiggery pokery in, in post-processing. But all that was, it was one of those days where it was very much sunshine and showers and, and, and uh, threatening skies. And when the sun poked through the clouds, part of the landscape got, uh, got spotlit and that's all that's happened here. And the only way that, um, or the way that I've, I've managed to capture this um, at the time was to do a spot meter reading uh, from near the tree so that uh, that's exposed correctly and the background stays dark because otherwise if we're shooting on um, evaluative or matrix metering, 
all that's going to happen is that the meter is going to assess the background, the overall scene, where there is a lot of darker tones, and um, it's going to actually raise the exposure, and it's going to burn out the highlights. So, um, you know, that's not what we want. Uh, this shot here was taken when I was with a group and we'd, we'd had a, a session uh, up in the Peak District and we were, the weather hadn't been great this particular day. And we were coming down off uh, over our tour. And it's always good to know what might happen with the sun. And although you can see there's some thick, heavy cloud there, often what happens um, is that there's a gap between the bottom layer of the cloud and the horizon, the land. So you know that at some stage, the sun is gonna drop down into that gap, albeit only for a few moments. Um, and so therefore you've got to plan for that. You've got to find a foreground and you've just got to wait for that sun to pop through. And often you can get very dramatic images. And certainly, you know, this, is, uh, this was the case in point here. And we were running around like madmen trying to find compositions and, uh, and get some foreground interest. Uh, the next couple of shots are, are very similar and it's interesting that you know sometimes you'll find a technique or you'll you'll find a composition that you think works and then you'll apply it in, in a different scenario so this shot here was taken at uh, dovestone reservoir and uh, you can see it's a long exposure or is it because whilst the reservoir itself is nice and smooth and it's clearly had long exposure the clouds um, are pretty well defined and they're certainly not the same length of exposure as we've seen on, on the water there. Um, and it's pretty bold composition, putting this stone bang in the middle, you know, judges would probably say you don't put it in the middle, but you know, you got one stone and um, I just felt it was quite appropriate to put it there. It seemed quite right. But what I've done here is a technique that I'll often do when I'm shooting long exposures. And that is obviously I'll take an exposure that's a long exposure where the clouds are blurred. Then I'll take the filter off and I'll take a standard exposure without the, without the um, ND filter on. And that's what I've done here. And I've blended here the sky from one shot with the uh, water from the other. So we've got that sort of contrast and that, that can quite often uh, work quite nicely. But the concept of having this quite bold foreground was something that I, um, I, I implemented as well when I was up in the Lake District um, around sunrise at Bleetarn. And you can see here, this is one where I've left the uh, the sky as it was. So I've not, uh, I've not, I can't remember whether I took a, a straight shot here or not. But it's the same sort of concept, isn't it, of having something quite bold in the foreground, and then the warm morning light coming up um, over um, over the the Langdale Pikes there in the background. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that thunder in the background um, coming through outside. I've got my window open, so um, it's not my stomach; it's the it's the thunder. Um, but, um, but yeah, dramatic, uh, talking about drama and uh, dramatic light, then um, this is a favorite place of mine. And um, North Norfolk, I think, is, is a wonderful place to go. And I really like going to Thornham because you get the benefit of having some wonderful salt flats and uh, estuaries and big skies. I mean, Norfolk's all about big skies, isn't it? But then there are also little boats and wrecks and things around here that you can, uh, that you can play around with. So, you know, that's really, really good. And, and again, here, it's that contrast between the uh, steely gray blue tones in the sky and repeated on the boat. But then we've got on this side, on the shadow side of the boat, the warm greeny brown tones um, on the side of the boat and uh, in, in the sort of uh, reeds and whatever in the, in the, in the foreground. <coughs> So um, yeah, and, and, and you know, I've, I've here what I've done is I've, I've darkened down the outside a bit just to give some more prominence to the, uh, to the boat there. Um, we'll stay by the sea and um, I'll show you a couple of pictures that were, that were took, um, I think they were three years ago now. Um, when Fuji launched their uh, GFX, their medium format or almost medium format um, camera that was 50 megapixels, um, they sent me that up to try and you don't get them for long. You know, they might say you've got them for four days or a week or whatever. And you, it's a question of almost like dropping everything and going. And much like when I was in the uh, in the Peak District to do that Heather shot and slept in the car, I went up to Whitby and uh, and slept in the car there because I'd only got this camera for like four days or whatever. And I wanted to make the most of it. So I went up to Whitby and uh, tried to sleep in the car couldn't so it was very easy getting out very early in the morning and this was shot would you believe at 3 45 a.m uh, and this was shot on the 50 megapixel medium format and if any of you uh, are thinking about um, getting ultimate image quality then uh, you know 
I, I can seriously recommend looking at the uh, GFX range of either 50 megapixel, which is just about to be relaunched uh, with version two, or the recently launched 100 megapixel. Um, and uh, they represent really good value for money. They're not cheap, but when you look at the prices and um, they're probably similar prices to top end Sony full frame cameras, um, and, and probably the soon to be launched Canon uh, version as well. Um, you know, they represent great value for money and the image quality is just fabulous. So uh, that was taken from above uh, Whitby Harbour. And then obviously I walked down onto the harbour and this one was taken, um, I think about an hour and a half later. Um, and the quality is just fabulous. You know, all the detail in that, uh, in the grain on the wood there is, um, is superb. And so it was, um, it was, yeah, it was a good outing really. I enjoyed that trip up there. It was uh, very good indeed. Um, one of the concepts and one of the features on a camera that you know I really, really like, and it helps so much, um, which probably came in now longer than I like and than I imagine. I'm thinking it's like seven, eight years, but who knows, it might be 10 years. Um, but it's the thing that we never had, which was a flip out screen. And the benefit of the flip out screen is that it will help you get images that perhaps otherwise you may never have got before. It helps you change your perspective. Um, and in particular, it helps you get down low. So, um, you know, when you've got dodgy backs and dodgy knees or anything like that, and you can't get down low, having a flip out screen really helps. So getting the camera down low, the camera here is on the tripod, the tripod is in the water. The camera is a few inches here above the water. And um, it just enables you to use the wide angle lens, make the most of this foreground. And it almost feels like, the, uh, the water is gushing into the lens, doesn't it? So, um, you know, it just helps you change perspective and it's really, really good. So um, I can, a lot of people say to me, how can I improve my pictures? And I say, well, do you want me to give you away without, uh, without spending any money? And they all say, yes, please. And it's basically change your perspective, go higher and shoot down or go lower. And often it's easier to go lower. And if you've got a flip out screen, it really makes it uh, very, very much easier. Uh, this one was shot in autumn and autumn is is certainly one of my favorite times to shoot um and this one taken over derwent water um was um, i'll al I always go to the lakes in uh, at the very end of october or beginning of november and uh, this particular time there's some very rich tones there in the in, in in the trees which were fabulous but i put this in really just to um provoke some thought about you know whenever you're thinking about what you're shooting and i did say to you at the very outset that the question really is uh, the why and the what should be should come before the how so why am i taking this picture and what am i trying to say and one of the fundamental questions is am i trying to take a picture of something or am i trying to take a picture about something so if you're taking a picture of the boathouse it might suggest that what you may well do is zoom in much tighter and okay you might have some trees behind it but you'd probably have a much tighter crop than this. This is almost the equivalent like of an environmental portrait, isn't it? It shows that boathouse in its surroundings. So this is perhaps more a picture about the boathouse uh, and we've got the, the layers and we've got the trees behind and then the fells behind that. Um, so it's really important to understand what you're trying to say with your picture. But what I could always recommend is that you do both because when we're out in the landscape and particularly when we've got fabulous conditions, um, you know, if you've missed something or you've not taken that wide shot or that zoomed in shot, you can't go back and do it. You can't really crop in because all the perspectives will be different. So what I tend to do is when I'm on location like this is I start with the wide shots and then gradually move in. And that was born out of one situation when I went to a location, took some pictures, came back and I looked at them and I thought, OK, these are all these are all detailed shots or, or zoomed in shots. Where's my establishing shot that shows it's like this particular shot we're looking at here? And I never had one. So ever since then, what I've done is I've started wide and, and moved in. So hopefully that might help some of you. Um, and what I often see is, um, is people, you know, when, they, when they're out with me or other photographers, you know, they'll, they'll walk up to a location and what they'll tend to do is, um, you know, so walk here and wherever I'm standing or wherever they, they tend to put the tripod down, that's where they'll take the picture from. Whereas actually there's very much more to do before you start, um, you know, plonking the tripod down. And what I would say is just put your bag down, put the tripod down, look around, 
and just take in that atmosphere, you know, imbibe that atmosphere. Think about those things that I was saying earlier on, you know, about the um, about the heather. What is it that really appeals to you about this particular location, for example? And have a look around, walk around, see where the nice viewpoints are, see where you can separate elements, perhaps get your phone out, take a few phone shots and just see. Then get your camera out, move the camera to your eye. You'll know whether it's a wide angle shot at this stage or whether it's going to be a telephoto shot or a medium, telepho uh, medium um, zoom shot. Um, and at that stage, then you can then decide at what height you need to be um, and at what focal length and then and only then should you be getting the tripod out because all too many people will just plonk the tripod down and shoot from wherever they are. Um, so that's really my sort of workflow when I get to a place. I'll always take some time and sort of try and imbibe the atmosphere. And woodland is a, is a very difficult place to shoot, actually, um, because what we're trying to do is to sort order out of chaos. They're very, very chaotic, aren't they, woodlands? And so if we typically, you know, in the landscape, Many of us will use a wide angle lens. And the problem with that is when you use a wide angle lens in, in, landscape, in, the, in the forest is that you'll include a lot of the high canopy where often it's not full cover and you'll get gaps in the canopy which come out as bright highlights. And what they do is they distract the viewer and you don't want those. So, you know, you want to keep the viewer's attention in the frame. So what I tend to do is my standard lens tends to be a 70 to 200. Um, and what I'll do is I'll stand further back and then zoom in and that eliminates the canopy. It also compresses the perspective. It brings that background closer to the foreground and it isolates your subject. And in this particular case, of course, my main subject with those golden beech leaves in the middle being framed by those two trees, almost leaning in towards each other. Almost, I felt like they were almost talking to each other. Now, this shot here is an example of one that didn't work. Um, and it didn't work for a reason. And the reason was that I didn't wait long enough. Um, the concept was quite right because, you know, we've got an interesting foreground. And, you know, if you shoot for a number of seconds and there's any froth on the water, what will happen is it will swirl around and it will give you these patterns, which are fabulous. And, and so, you know, that works quite well. It's not as good as it could do. I'm not that happy with it, but, but you know, it's quite interesting. But what isn't working here are the highlights. If you look at the tree on the left-hand side and behind it, there's loads of highlights there, which just take your eye away. And yes, you could, I could darken them down a bit more than I have done yet, but I'm trying to show you this to, 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 to really highlight the point that, you know, if you go out and it's an overcast day, it's a perfect day for going and shooting streams and woodland because you don't get this, this challenge, this issue with bright highlights. Uh, and if you are there and it's like that, hopefully there might be a few clouds in the sky and the sun might just pop behind those clouds for a few moments. And then it's worth waiting to be able to get those conditions. But while you're walking around in the woodland, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've heard many people say to you before, you know, just make sure that you look around and don't forget to look behind you. And that's exactly what happened this day when I was in the woods. And I looked behind me, this was about 10.30 in the morning in the autumn. And I just looked behind me and the sun was rising, but it was backlighting all this vapor in the atmosphere. And it was creating all these rays. And someone did, I posted this on Instagram and someone said, did you put those in? And the honest answer is no, I didn't. Um, but I saw them and it was just magical. Somebody else posted on that same uh, post. I'm expecting a fairy to pop out there from behind the from behind the tree. Um, well, unfortunately, no fairies popped out, but um, I did manage to get a picture. And you know, it's very easy to miss these things. So always have your wits about you and uh, and and look around. And and like shooting sun stars, if you can get sun stars um, by using a narrow aperture, that's what we normally do. Try not to shoot at f22 because you get diffraction and it softens your image. Hopefully, f16 should work. And this is another one that was shot up in Sherwood Forest um, in the autumn. And again, it's early in the morning and the water, vapor, you can see that there's the dew on the bracken and there's mist there. And, you know, it's just been backlit. So it's just fabulous. And because it's close to home, um, let's let's stay up there for a couple more images and we'll go up to um, up into Sherwood Forest. And this one was one of my favourite scenes, actually. Unfortunately, since I took this picture, what would it be, 18 months ago now, um, this tree's blown over in the gale. So it's still there, but it's on its side now, which is uh, rather, uh, rather disappointing. 
Um, but I love this because it almost frames this little copse of birch trees behind it. And we've got that mist in the background, again, giving us some separation. Because, you know, what mist can do, certainly when we're in woodland, is it can help separate. And we, we, we therefore reduce that chaos um, and, uh, and that too much detail that we've got in the, in the picture. So I thought putting this on the right hand side with it curving back over would then frame that little copse of, uh, of birch trees there in the background. And then this next shot here is a is a great one just to say that, you know, this could be this is a little nondescript bit of woodland near near Calverton um, that I walked into, would you believe in February? And there were still these leaves, these beech leaves on, on the trees. And again, a bit of mist in the background helps us separate the foreground from the background. But I did mention earlier that if you can get out and, and shoot locally and have some places that you can go to, then that's exactly what you should do. And um, that's what I've done here. There's a tree that's just up the road from me. It's like five minutes away. Um, and I went the other night and uh, came away again because it you know, wasn't any good. But, um, but you know, you just keep going back there and, 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 and taking different pictures in different conditions. And so if you have got something like this, just make sure that you, you, you do constantly go back different times of day, different weather, um, you know, rain and snow, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you've seen quite a few, you know, quite, uh, quite, quite saturated pictures, quite uh, colourful pictures, but it's not always about that. And, um, you know, I often like the muted colours as well. And I just talked there about shooting waterfalls and uh, overcast conditions. This was a case in point, which, you know, I really, really liked. This was taken in um, Watercombe Jollydale in the Peak District. And as I walked along there, I saw this tree and it seemed to be being engulfed. It was almost like Day of the Triffids and being engulfed by all these branches and reeds and things. And it was sort of fighting against it. But there's no harsh lighting here. It's all soft lighting. Um, and it enabled me to, to, to capture that shot with lots of, uh, lots of detail in it without having the, running the risk of any, any burnt out highlights. Um, so, uh, and this one is, is cropped to five by four. Five by four is a great crop for landscapes, particularly in the vertical format, because I often find that a three to two aspect ratio is too long and thin for a portrait format image. But, um, but for, for uh, five by four, it works, or 10 by eight, same thing. It works really, really well. Um, this shot here, again, I talked about seminal images. This one is the seminal image because this is the first outing uh, ever of my first Fuji, my Fuji XE1. And I remember walking into these woods at five in the morning. Um, the smell of the bluebells was absolutely overpowering. There was a hint of mist, a very, very gentle breeze. And because the light levels were actually quite low, it's amazing what the cameras picked up, but this exposure was 14 seconds. So over that time, there's obviously been a little bit of movement in the beech leaves, which I think works quite nicely. If I'd wanted to capture those as still, I would have had to have bumped up the ISO quite high. And I really didn't know at this stage, it was the first time I'd used the Fuji, how it would how it would respond. And I guess I should have taken that, but actually I didn't. So we've got a little bit of movement on those leaves, which works quite nicely. Um, and um, yeah, and, and when I saw that shot, I just thought, wow, you know, this is a, this is a great little point and shoot camera. This is it's obviously much more than that. But, you know, it's not necessarily about the big vistas it's not about these scenes as well it's about the photographer's eye of seeing little bits of detail um, and these backlit beech leaves um, and I think what works here again is that contrast between the the vibrant green and the and the bluey tones in the background or when I was shooting for Fuji with that X100F when I was testing that for them walking out to uh, the end of Friars Crag for that black and white shot that square shot I looked down at the path and, and saw these frosted leaves, you know, and I've just toned this, converted it to black and white and toned it. Um, very recently, um, this year, I went out and, uh, and shot, there was one fabulous poppy field that I found, um, but what I actually enjoyed was isolating some detail and just taking, uh, just taking on a long lens and just focusing in on one uh, and really, you know, separating them out you know exactly what's in the background you can see the splodges of red you know it's a poppy field but I think that one works much better for me well I say better it works in tandem it's good to have the big field and that's perhaps back to my earlier point make sure that you do both but it's equally good to um, to take that telephoto shot and isolate that detail um, as I did here and this one was taken near that Monet bridge um, just pulling out that um, you know there's a lovely green background and it, the whole the, the, the only um, uh, contrast with that is that uh, yellow sort of buttercup. 
Um, it's amazing, you know, sometimes what uh, what your cameras can do that perhaps, as I said earlier, you're not aware of. Um, this shot here of these bluebells was actually taken with an in-camera filter in the Fuji. Um, some of your cameras will have um, sort of art filters or Fuji call them advanced filters. I think I think they're called art filters with Olympus. Um, but this is taken on the soft focus filter. And this is just a JPEG straight out of camera, um, just on a soft focus. And, you know, you can get some great images, um, you know, shooting uh, um, in that scenario. And uh, there are other filters in there as well, which, which do other things like dynamic tone and um, toy and various other things. But um, yeah, I like with flowers, the soft focus one works pretty well. Um, we'll just have a few black and whites and I'm gonna start with um, some infrared shots actually, because I got one of my uh, previous uh, Fuji bodies converted to infrared. And uh, here's that famous tree again, look, um, shot with uh, infrared. And this is, um, you have two choices if you want to shoot infrared. It's a great time of year to shoot now, of course. Uh, you can either buy an R, a Hoya R72 filter and, and use that, um, which is great, but it's quite dense. It doesn't let a lot of light through, so you've got to watch your shutter speeds. And invariably, you, you might get away on the brightest conditions of hand holding, but usually you might have to use a tripod, which is fine unless you've got some subject movement, because then you're going to get you're going to get your trees moving or your, your grasses moving or whatever. So the best way around it, really, if uh, if you want to do more of it is to get a camera converted and this one has got the 720 nanometer filter in it uh, so here's a tree here uh, my local tree and here's um, a tree that's become very special to me um, I call this my Medusa tree because of all these like tentacles that come out. Um, and this one won me a, an award this year. This one won um, a highly commended award in the Siena 2021 Creative Awards. So I was really quite chuffed with that. And uh, as I say, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, you need that contrast. So, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is if you're shooting infrared is just shoot all fields. What the, of course, the effect that you get is that any foliage, anything that's green is going to go white or nearly white. So it's no good just show to shooting lots of that. You need a contrast. So in this particular case, the fabulous uh, trunk and branches on this tree provided that uh, that contrast, you know, and back up at Columbia Park, as did the, um, you know, the two elements here that stand out for me is obviously the style and the church. Um, and, and they look normal, but the rest of it, you know, looks like it's snowing, doesn't it? And uh, it gives a rather interesting effect. And I, I like that style. It almost almost makes me feel like I can step over that and into the picture. So it's uh, it's quite a nice uh, intro. And um, staying in Clumber Park, just to the right there of the church, um, we've got this little um, this little folly here. And I love the way that the trees there sort of branch out over and they sort of uh, guard over it. And uh, I like the shadows there being cast on, on the ground uh, beneath. So um, yeah, I do like shooting with um, with that infrared. And uh, the the last shot there on infrared taken up on uh, on Lake Coniston. Um, and this jet is fabulous because of course it's got that interesting kink to it. And you can see that the lighting is good. It's towards the end of the day. The sun's going down over there to the right hand side. And it's casting these shadows uh, across the walkway. And we've got the whole bit of the rim there of um, of Lake Coniston. Uh, with all the trees sort of rim lit, uh, which is uh, which really makes it stand out a little bit. Um, it's interesting sometimes. I mean, obviously, many of us will shoot raw, in which case we're shooting a raw color image. You might set your um, your viewfinder to uh, to black and white, uh, but generally speaking, many of us will be shooting a color image, which then will decide whether to keep color or will convert to black and white. And this image here was shot in the Alps. It's the Aguil de Drew, and I I remember. Um, walking around the corner and seeing this site in front of me. And I just thought, wow, just look at that. That looks so dramatic. It looks so threatening, so dangerous. That jagged sawtooth ridge, those three peaks there. You know, what must it like be like to be on top of those? There's probably a decent path up there. I don't know, probably not, but you know what I'm saying. Probably not as bad as it looks, but from here, it looks blooming threatening and I, I wouldn't want to be there. But you know what? When I looked at that and I looked at the picture, um, maybe not when I was there, but when I got when I got home, um, it didn't have that feeling that I had at the time when I saw it. And the reason for that was, as it's a colour image, the sky, the dark bits in the sky would, were blue. It was a blue sky. And if you've got a blue sky, it means it's like it's a sunny day. It's bright. It's 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 a nice day. 
And I didn't want to portray that. That wasn't what I felt. Um, and I think it's David Allen Harvey from Magnum who said, don't shoot what you feel. Uh, don't shoot what you see, shoot what you feel. And um, although obviously I shot what I saw there, I actually post-processed it to uh, deliver and, and, and show what I actually felt at the time, which was uh, which hopefully the black and white does make it a bit more threatening and a bit more ominous than a brighter, more vibrant um, colour picture. Um, let's go back down to Suffolk. This is Shingle Street. And this was a, a 30 second exposure, which was about the longest that I could manage because the I was being buffeted, almost buffeted, really, um, by by the wind coming in off the sea. And I'd got a, a big golf brolly trying to protect the uh, the camera with um, with a 10 stop filter on for 30 seconds. And fortunately, I did it. But the light was just fabulous and it was really quite strong. And it really gave me that contrast between the silvery uh, water and then this sort of spit here, this shingle spit of, that is literally the, it's dark, it's uh, it's dark pebbles. So we got that contrast and the shape's really quite interesting. And of course, the, with, with the wind blowing so fast, we've got some interesting movement there in the, uh, in the sky. Um, as I say, I do like using uh, long exposures and, and there's a bit of license here because uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of images that are also long exposures. I wouldn't say they're quite nature, but let's just say we're smoothing out uh, nature in terms of the water and the sky. Uh, they're not sort of um, rural landscapes. These are more urban landscapes. But, um, you know, I'm often asked what, uh, you know, as a travel photographer, where's your favourite location? And, um, you know, I'm always spoilt for choice. There are two that stand out. Cuba, because it is just so unique, so fabulous. The people are wonderful. Uh, it's a photographer's paradise. But then so is Venice. Um, it really is. And I went three years ago, spent a week there and spent of that time four days shooting images that were going to be all sort of fine art type black and white images. And I love this image because it's just so simple. And, you know, in compositions, often it's a case of less is more. And when you look at this image, you can see that there's so much negative space in this image. The water is so smooth. There's no detail in it. Um, the sky, <clears throat> there's very little detail in the sky. So what we're left with is this very narrow strip here in the middle of the frame. And yet what that does, it directs the viewer. The viewer is not going to look at the sky and the water. They're going to look at that narrow strip because that's where the detail is. And therefore you investigate those lovely buildings and all the windows and the doors and the rooftops and the lovely shapes and, the, and, and that typical sort of quintessential Italian feel to it. And then we've got the church of Red Entori in the middle dominating the skyline, standing sort of proud there. And because it's proud, you know, where, where do you put it? Um, I put it on the right hand third and it doesn't look right. I put it in the middle and it works and it works square. It works vertical like that. And I think for me, uh, even in this landscape format, it works there as well. So one of the benefits of using long exposures is it does smooth out those details and it lets the viewer therefore, it let, uh, makes the viewer look at those elements of the scene that you want them to look at. The final black and white, the penultimate um, image this evening is, uh, is this one here. It's a similar sort of concept. This one was taken in Austria, in Vienna. And uh, this is taken at the Schönbrunn Palace. It's the Gloriette, which is the summer house. And we went there, uh, I think it was the end of February. Uh, Vienna's a wonderful place, I'd never been before, but it is a wonderful place. But going at that, we got a good deal. And why did we get a good deal? Because it's that time of year and you gamble with the weather and we gambled and lost. And we were there for, I think, three or four nights. And for most of the time, it was it was sleety. It was, you know, one degree. It was a bit rainy and oh, it was horrible. But the final morning, uh, it didn't rain, but it had snowed overnight. And so we made our way up to the Chambrun Palace and then walked back up to the uh, right to the back there to look over at what you can imagine would be a fabulous setting in the in the summer. I happen to think it was fabulous in the winter as well. Um, there are a few people there, but because they're moving and this is a one minute exposure, they're not rendered visible. We've also got those clouds, as I mentioned before, whooshing towards us. The one minute exposure has smoothed out the lake. So we've got a reflection. And if you're ever you're working with the reflection and you're wondering where to put your subject, put it in the middle because that's absolutely fine with a reflection. But I think the other thing that really helped with this image was that the snowfall that we'd had overnight just helped lift that grass bank. Because if you imagine if that was a green grass bank in black and white terms, that would have been a fairly dark tone. So just having that lifted with that strip of white, I think really helped lift the, uh, lift the picture. And, and, and for me, that one, that one worked really nicely. 
I'm not going to leave you with a black and white image. You've seen so many colour ones, but I, will, I am going to leave you with perhaps my favourite landscape image that, um, that I've ever taken. There was a bit of luck involved in this, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. This shot here was taken at Zabriskie Point in Death Valley. It was taken just after sunrise and I've been out shooting um, folds in the lap. Well, I was out shooting sunrise and, and I, I basically I've got the camera on the tripod and I was shooting abstract pictures. It was just folds in the landscape. There was a little bit of method in my madness um, and I had determined that I was not going to include the sky because if you don't include the sky, you don't know how long this landscape extends for. You know, it could extend for 100 yards or 100 miles. You just don't know. So I wanted to give the impression of this unending landscape. So that's what I was shooting. It was pretty much abstract type pictures. All of a sudden, five people appeared and they're walkers going out early in the morning before it gets too hot for, for a walk into Death Valley. And, you know, they were there and they were all clumped together, all five of them. And I'm willing them, I'm wishing that they would separate. We need separation, don't we, between key elements in the image. <coughs> and um, what happened was that I was willing them and just hoping that something would happen. And um, all of a sudden, three of them disappeared over the edge and it left me with two. Now, three would have been better, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. I'm happy with two. I managed to rattle off about four pictures and then they too turned tail and went on and uh, they were gone and that was it. But for that fleeting moment, I got those th that picture with those two people. And, you know, someone said to me once that was a lucky shot. And I said, well, you know, I beg to differ with you. Um, and um, I refer you to a famous quote from the golfer, Gary Player, who, when he was asked if he'd had a lucky shot, said, you know, it, it's amazing. The harder I practice, the luckier I get. And I think that's very true of, uh, of photography. Whatever genre we shoot, the more effort we put into it, the harder we work at it, the more opportunities that will pop up and more times that scenarios like this, where those three people just, just disappeared and it left me with two nicely separated, giving this picture some scale and some context without which you would have no idea what this was um, really really was um, was it wasn't luck it was uh, it was it was reward for a lot of hard work getting up early and um, you know a, a lot of effort behind this so that's it um, I hope you've enjoyed it this evening I hope um, there's been quite a few hints and tips there along the way um, so I hope you've enjoyed some of those and um, I hope most of all that you've enjoyed uh, the images and, and, and they've inspired you to get out there as quickly as you can and um, capture your own beauty from our wonderful nature. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing and uh, you can put your cameras back on and unmute yourselves and I'm very happy to um, answer any questions. Well, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, yeah, I, I, when you were talking about the luck, I was actually thinking about Gary Player when you uh, said about Gary Player. And the last time I heard him say that, he then, after he said it, stepped into the bunker, chipped out straight into the hole. Yeah. So the more balls you hit, the more images you take. Um, I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? So it that, is, that, yeah. that was That was really, really fantastic. And the time has really flown by. So we, we've had we've had a few questions. Um, there was one little question about brightness in the highlights, but no, I think that's not the case. But very very briefly on there, there was a comment about burnt out highlights around the sun. Um, what I would say is that tends not to be an issue uh, because there was a reference to the licentiate. Um, it tends not to be a problem um, around the sun. Obviously, in the cloud area. That's where <coughs> normally you would expect to see some control. Um, but it, is, can is I there... just come in on that one? Yeah, of course you can, Chris. There's a, there's a picture. There's a picture which I have in my travel talk actually, and it's uh, it's one of my favourite ones, and it's taken in Cuba, yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's a guy who's delivering something. And he's on a horse and cart, and he's standing up, and he's backlit, and he's got a hat on, and there's a lady coming out of the shadows, and it's really quite atmospheric. The sun is right behind him, and it's blasting out, and it's burnt out. Now, I think it's really interesting, this concept, because, you know, what is a picture all about? Does it really matter that it's technically perfect if there's some emotion or some feel in it? And personally, I feel that it's the emotion that is more important. You know, I would refer you to, um, you know, some of uh, Cartier Bresson's pictures, which, if we're honest and look at them, the guy leaping over the decisive moment over the puddle, he's not sharp. 
But does that matter? Not it's sure. about it's about that moment and it's about that moment in time. And I understand that for things like you know, a licentiateship or any of the you know adjudications, then you, you know you, you you want to see that someone can can handle that. But what I would say is, you know, don't. And this is what bugs me when we often get you know camera club uh, judges who will criticise pictures like that, but they miss the point. They miss the point about what my my message was at the beginning about emotion in a picture and feeling in a picture. Does it really matter if something's not quite sharp or something is blown out a little bit? And, you know, I think, you know, yeah, we all might have a different opinion on that. I can just give you mine. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right, Chris. And of course, with your example, that sun is right behind him. So it's almost framing him, isn't it? Yeah. Um, might be a completely different um, aspect if it was right over on the left hand side of the image or the right hand side, for example, and mm. distracted you from the main subject. But I absolutely agree with you. So uh, brilliant response. Thank you. So I'm just scanning down. Um, there's a question about where lenses were built, um, where they changed um, from Japan to China. Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice any difference? <laughs> You know, I think it's one of those things that so Fuji did start to produce some of their lenses uh, in, uh, in in China, not in Japan. Um, no, I mean, Fuji lenses are fabulous. Fuji make, have made lenses for a long time for Hasselblad. Um, they are renowned for their lenses. And if you buy the red badge lenses for the for the X series, they are stunning lenses. They really are. Um, the GFX lenses are wonderful. Um, no, I mean, you know, like all manufacturers, they will have a range of lenses at different price points because, you know, people's motivations for buying gear and what they want is, is very different. Some people will be working to ultimate image quality. Some people might be working to size, weight or budget. And so there's there's a lens to suit everybody there. But, you know, no, I, I mean, I mean, the, the quality control will still be there. I'm not aware of there being any issues. Um, I've not seen anything online people complaining that the lenses that are built in China aren't as good as the ones in Japan but you know yeah and someone might have seen something but I can't you know you you, you wouldn't um you wouldn't risk your reputation would you if you're a decent manufacturer by um by scoring an own goal like that you you wouldn't would you you wouldn't well, not once you built it and uh, established it definitely no. not so yeah brilliant um lots of complimentary messages about the talk very good talk um brilliant Gareth, did you have a question? You unmuted. Uh, which one, uh, Stuart? <laughs> uh, Gareth Martin, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I didn't mean that. I, I wrote two things. No, no question. Just I said it when uh, Chris mentioned, uh, why not have something in the foreground, in the centre? And I've been mentioning it myself in talks, that's all, that uh, it's nice to have something in the centre. Where else would you put it, Chris, sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Work on the left or the right, it's got to be in the centre. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. all. It wasn't a question, it was not. Ah, right. I, th I, think, I think that's an interesting point, Gareth, isn't it? You know, we all have these, we all learn photography and composition, particularly with um, these rules, tools, guides. But, you know, rules are there to be broken, aren't they? And, you know, why not put something on the edge of the frame? Why not create some tension by putting something right on the edge of the frame? You know, why not? Um, you know, and, and why not put something in the middle if you think it's right? And uh, to totally agree, Gareth, yes. Yeah, I, put, um, I put an LOL at the end of it because I said I'm a judge as well. <laughs> <laughs> you got, you, you, you're, I'm not sure whether you're a poacher turned gamekeeper or a gamekeeper turned poacher, but there you go. You got a foot in both counts. <laughs> and I think you like small prints, don't you, Gareth? Yeah, I, I'm known for doing miniatures, Chris. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the Orton effect, I think, is a Photoshop plugin, isn't it? Now you can do it manually, with um, this, but is there a plugin? Yeah, there are certain things. So things like Raya Pro, for example, you can select Orton effect there and it will yeah. do it for you. Uh, it is actually very easy to do if you know your way around sort of layers and things and, and because you want to be able to adjust it and amend it. So uh, but there are, I think, plugins and there's some that are similar. So if any of you have got um, the Nick um, effects um, package, um, then there's one there called, um, I think it's Sunburst. I think it's called Sunburst. And that that one there, the, 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 the sort of default one, which I think is 20 percent, 
that will do it as well. So it warms up the image, it softens it, and it brightens it. To my taste, it's a little bit too much. So I always, I always reduce the opacity from 20 to 10. Right. And that seems to work quite nicely. But um, that's a one click and that'll do it for you as well. Fabulous. And I think there's a discount on uh, the new version of Nick Filters at the moment until the end of the month. I think. The end of the month, that's right. I, yeah. I, up, I upgraded mine the other day and it is quite an upgrade in some of the uh, um, processes. So uh, yeah. well worth looking at. So thank you. Um, when everybody gets a problem with that, I upgraded early on in the months and I couldn't get it to work at all. So I contacted them and they sent me a very detailed uh, document and a new slightly newer version and it all works smoothly after that right. so if anybody has a problem just write to them and they'll sort it out for you ah, thank you ralph i know um I, I i didn't seem to have any problems updating grade in mind but um some did and what i suggested was they deleted the previous version completely from their computer and then reloaded it and that seemed to do the trick as well so one one or the other so maybe, yeah, that, maybe was, that was part of it yeah lovely thank you thank you ralph richard did you unmute or have you just been allowed to stop doing the washing up for a minute <laughs> did you have a question at all richard uh, i can make one up if you like so chris <laughs> hi richard <laughs> <laughs> you tested the gfx 100s um have you had any more thoughts about whether you're going to change or carry on as you are um, you know, I'm in a camp really with, um, there's a few, there's a few ex-photographers and, um, Andy Mumford is also an ambassador who's based in Portugal and he's not, he's, he hasn't, he hasn't changed either. So the GFX is fabulous. It really is. Um, but it is bigger, it is heavier and there's not as much versatility with the lenses. And I like very much using the longer end of the zoom range. And so obviously with hundred megapixels, you can zoom in um and but i just like doing it in camera and i like i like being able to uh, you know crop in camera and to be fair to be fair for what i do i can print at home a2 prints and i've done bigger prints than that i mean fuji have printed one of my images off an xt1 which was a 16 megapixel uh, sensor to three meters by two meters at the nec so you know it can be done how big do you want your pictures so um undoubtedly it is a fabulous fabulous camera and, um, and, and the image quality is insane. It really is. So lots of things going for it. Um, I'm not saying never, but just at the moment, maybe not. Lovely, thank you. Um, Simon's asked about street photography. I don't know, do you do any street <coughs> photography, Chris? Well, um, street photography, I, I mean, I, I will as part of travel photography. So, you know, yeah. what is travel photography? It's an amalgam of lots of different genre, isn't it? Um, so I do do some street photography, but as I say, that tends to be on, on my travels. That's why you haven't seen any inner nature landscape talk tonight. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I use a different mate, but I also have a Fuji X-Pro2, which I use for street photography, and it really is a beautiful camera. And I think yeah. for me, part of the attraction of it is exactly what you said during the talk, that the shutter speed and the aperture dial is on the outside. So if you're used to looking at the light and working out the exposure by looking at the light and you can then just transfer the, uh, it really is a marvellous camera for street photography. The thing is as well with the Fujis, they're, they're, they're small and they're, as I said in that video, they're unobtrusive. Yeah. So it's almost like you, you blend into the background much more. You've not got, you know, a white lens on the front of your camera and, and, and right. a big DSLR. So, and, and the benefit as well is that if you want, you can have, you know, the tiny f2 lenses on a small body or you can have the red badge you know 70 to 200 24 to 72.8 equivalents if you want so you have choices um which is really really good with uh, with the system yeah yeah and they they i mean the other system i use is olympus and they both look like old film cameras yeah. really yeah and i think that's part of the uh, story as well you just seem yeah. to blend in yeah so uh, yeah does that answer your question simon are you yeah all right yep yeah you were at one of the meetings the other day when you signed so uh yeah brilliant so just looking through um trevor mentions the lens baby yeah i don't know if you've tried the lens baby at all no i haven't no features. it's one of the things i see some fabulous work from various people and um you know but yeah. i've never used it myself no no brilliant 
so I think that's all the questions in the chat line unless I've missed any and if I've missed any please do shout up or if anybody else has got any questions they'd like to ask Chris now um, through the microphone please shout out Stuart I'll only say to Chris I knew I should have cut that boat at Patchings loose when we were down there before you got there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Howard. <laughs> you're, you're so competitive, Howard. <laughs> no. So, Chris, I think we've seen some beautiful images today. You've taken us all around the world and it's been really, really enjoyable. And, and I, I really um, would emphasise that, shoot what you feel. I mean, this emotive response to the image is just so important, I think. And when you started talking about the movement in the trees, I mean, I know Joe Cornish um, sort of looks for evidence like that. And of course, um, John Blakemore, of course, really engaged with the landscape mm. in that sort of emotive way and how he felt about it. Mm. Um, and, and I think I think there was one story where he spent a whole year commissioned to photograph one tree for a whole year. Yeah. Um, so. I think that, I don't think you can do enough of that. So thank you ever so much for your time tonight. Um, if I can ask everybody to unmute and just give Chris um, one of those one of those claps, if that's all right. And um, I think I think we've um, I think that's four great talks we've had from you now, Chris, over the last few years. So um, we'll have to make it five very soon. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Stuart, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in this evening. And, um, you know, uh, I hope to say, I'm sure I'll see many of you in your in your clubs and as I do more club talks coming up. But uh, thanks very much again, guys. Um, take care and stay safe. Thank you very um, much, Chris. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you, Chris. Bye. Thank you. And, and thank you, everybody, for being a great audience. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Stuart. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Robert.